In our last video, we discussed a few sociocultural and theological reasons as to why Paul and Barnabas were perceived as embodiments of Hermes and Zeus when they spread the word of God to the people in the Asia Minor town of Lycaonia. In this video, I suggest we dig a little deeper and explore a more mystical and esoteric explanation for the phenomena of theophanies and apparitions. To aid us in this journey, we will explore the work of Ibn Arabi and the influence of the Islamic Neoplatonists, combined with Iamblichus' system of metaphysics. I believe the work of Henry Colbin is integral to understanding the nature of prochodos, procession, and epistrophe, return. A deeper, more subtle reading would be invaluable for those who seek to engage in the hieratic art of theurgy. We will finally explore Colbin's suggestion that docetism should be viewed not as a particular doctrine, but as a spiritual and psychological orientation towards theophanies and epiphanies. Generally, docetism is the belief that Jesus Christ's body was either absent or merely an apparition. Generally, the criticism of docetism by Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox believers implies that this assertion is suggesting that Christ's body was merely an illusion. But, as we have discussed in previous videos, an illusion or an idol or an apparition is a psychic image, and it still participates in the real. This means that images exist on a certain level of reality and cannot be reduced to non-being. It would be similar to denying the reality of dreams or mental images like thoughts. A helpful way of understanding and connecting both the visible and invisible realms is through the observation of images. All images exist within the substrate of the psyche. Whether they arise from there or enter the psyche is a whole other topic. But countless thousand images enter your mind and are produced from your imagination are invisible, but no less tangible, for they exist in potential. An image is like a seed that can take hold and grow in the visible realm if a certain level of awareness and will is attached to it, which is why ideas are so powerful. They are invisible images that can come to life and wreak havoc and destruction or provide help and antidotes to our suffering. But what is perhaps even more radical of an idea is that images become concretized. You look out your window and see an apartment building, you see people walking in the streets below, pets being taken for walks, trees lining the sidewalks, the sun in the sky and clouds are formlessly drifting by. These are all images, albeit in differing levels of manifestation and materiality. Anything you can perceive through your senses, including your imaginative perception, is connected in a long series of chains to levels of images. In theurgy, these processions, or seria, form correspondences through each ontological level of the hierarchy of being to be ultimately led by this or that particular god or goddess. But how does this relate to Christ? In Charles M. Stang's excellent book entitled Our Divine Double, he analyzes the apocryphal text of the Gospel of Thomas. In one section, he breaks down a very clear excerpt regarding the differentiation between likeness and image. Jesus said, When you see your likeness, aine, you rejoice. But when you see your images, ikon, which came into being before you, and which neither die or become manifest, how much more will you have to bear? Stang identifies this distinction Jesus is making based on Genesis 1 to 6. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. He then interprets the statement very similarly to how Henri Colbert and the Islamic Neoplatonists would have understood theophanic emanation. The understanding is that each one of us has an image that pre-exists us and in fact has brought us into being. Fundamentally, through the soul's descent into matter, Iamblichus would add, the truth of the matter becomes occluded, and the soul becomes embodied with the belief that it is the sole operator in the cosmic schema, and hence experiences existential alienation. But the soul, as Ibn Arabi along with Iamblichus would remind us, is not a self-contained totality. It in fact exists as a bi-unity, for every soul that exists, there is a celestial counterpart or counterpole, what the Hermetic Discourses speak of as the perfect nature, 
or in Zoroastrian belief, the Diana or Faravashi, the guardian angel, or the Lord, Rab, Navasal, Marvub, the loved and the lover. In the Islamic ascent, the Mirage, the soul performs Tavil, which is a form of spiritual exegesis that gathers the sensible data of the world and brings it back to its archetypal origins through the medium of the imaginal realm. It is transmuting the outward exoteric form into the esoteric or inner reality of the Hakikat. Every event in the cosmos that is perceived by the soul is simultaneously an event of the soul, and the soul restores each event to its original symbol through which it ascends closer and closer to its own angel or lord, slowly being revealed to the theurgist. Or, as Iamblichus says, quote, it is rather in virtue of the divine love which holds together all things that they provide a union of indissoluble involvement, not, as the name seems immediately to imply, inclining the mind of the gods to humans, but rather, as the truth of things itself desires to teach us, disposing the human mind to participation in the gods, leading it up to the gods, and bringing it in accord with them through harmonious persuasion. And it is for this reason, indeed, that the sacred names of the gods and the other types of divine symbol that have the capacity of raising us up to the gods are enabled to link us to them. When Christ says, quote, how much more will you have to bear? Stang remarks that this statement is, quote, a warning not only of how difficult it will be to bring this secret self to light so as to see it, but also that the vision of oneself at, or autoscopy will inaugurate a progressive and painful assimilation to that image. Rereading Iamblichus' On the Mysteries precisely verifies this painful experience. In the text, he says, Meaning, those of the genuine athletes of the fire are authentic and true. The term athletes of fire is used to describe the theurgists. The Greek word athlon is sometimes defined as prize, and it is a word from which we derive our word for athletics. But a more ancient and precise definition of the term is as a struggle or an ordeal. The translators are only providing us with the expression athletes of fire, but the implication undergirding this expression is of deep trial and torment. Theurgy is no light-hearted matter, and let that be a warning to those self-satisfied dilettantes who aim for casual spiritual experiences. Many people in the West find it difficult to accept passivity. Our entire culture and orientation to the world around us is one of heroism, we are the first to declare that if there is a will, there is a way. But as Iamblichus, Ibn Arabi, Surawardi, and the ancient Egyptian priests will show, one must empty oneself of one's willful striving and grasping and simply let go and make room for something else to re-enter. This prior state is one of udinea or nothingness of the creature. This is perhaps the largest and most difficult obstacle we find in the modern world its rampant narcissism and ego inflation. Theurgy is embodying the gods and creating vessels to be able to contain and receive their powers, but not in a restrictive containment, more along the lines of creating the capacity within the soul to embrace them when they show themselves. In Egyptian notions of dream states, the dreamer is always described as sleeping or comfortably resting in a state that suggests this receptivity or passivity. It is only on condition that the dreamer is passive and restful that the deity then chooses to reveal him or herself. This is similar to Iamblichus' emphasis on aporia as a precondition to theurgic practice. After my video, I was asked by a viewer, So now what? Now that you've admitted that you don't know anything and all concepts are voided in vain, and once you find yourself in this state of existential disorientation, what happens then? Iamblichus would respond that one has finally attained a state where all human wisdom is understood as worthless, and where all rational discourse and analysis is completely eroded. The stuff of the human overlay of thoughts and images associated with the egoic personality makes room for the fundamental power that pre-exists reason and its thinking. This is Eros. 
Like in Hesiod's Theogony, we see Eros as the creative primordial principle of the cosmos that even pre-exists the gods. Upon the stillness of the mind and thought, Eros reawakens and is reactivated, and through the powers of Eros, the soul is brought in its ascent to the gods after the aporia has brought about its purification. Iamblichus has an incredibly complicated and highly differentiated hierarchy of being that ranges from the one to the noetic gods, the hypercosmic gods and cosmic gods, sublunar gods or archons, archangels, angels, demons, heroes, purified souls, and finally our own embodied descended souls. I've purposely glanced over many of the higher gods in the hierarchy simply to avoid further inundation of information. According to Amblichus, each ontological level of being contains all the subsequent levels of being within it as you descend the chain, each one acting as a hypostasis. For example, the human soul would emanate from its counterpart angel from which it proceeds and to whom it desires and reverts upon and gives a form for manifestation. The same way the angels would be emanations and the ground of being of archangels who would represent the lord of that level of being. According to Ibn Arabi's articulation, each higher level of being in which the other lower level participates in is considered the angel or spirit of that being. Participation, of course, always relies on the non-identity of the worshipper and the worshipped, the Lord and his or her vassal. After all, you cannot participate in something higher than you if you are in essence identical with that thing through your attributes and your divine names. Which is why Ibn Arabi, along with Iamblichus, would have scoffed at Plotinus' assertion that he achieved a complete henosis at these four occasions during his lifetime. What Plotinus has achieved is not union with the One, but the Lord of his being, his celestial pole. In fact, in late Neoplatonism with Damascus, we come to the realization that the One does not in fact strictly exist, but is only perceived through its unifying energia. In Ibn Arabi's profound experience, we should not think of these levels as individual hypostases, like Plotinus's hypostasis of the soul, the noose, and the one, or the Christian's trinity of hypostases like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but rather view these as theophanic unions. Since the totality of each being has a dual structure, the archetype of each being is identical with the spirit or angel of that being. God, as the unity of theurgic activities, manifests himself in a multiplicity of forms, dividing himself into all the appropriate fractional components that we identify as our own personal lords or angels or spirits of our being. But each soul experiences their own personal lord, depending on the quality of their soul and the divine names and attributes they took with them from pre-existence. In essence, Talem eum vidi qualem capere potui, I saw him in such a form as I was able to take in, is derived from the apocryphal acts of Peter, and is ceaselessly repeated by Colbert to remind us that our ability to perceive spiritual realities in the Lord or angel of our being, i.e. God in his polymorphic diversity of forms, is dependent upon the quality and nature of our own individual souls. The moment a soul has severed his or her bond with his or her specific lord archetype, meaning that they've lost knowledge of themselves, the ego, quote, degenerates into a spiritual imperialism, and in this state insists on imposing the same lord on each and every person, thus resulting in dogmatism of all stripes. Ibn Arabi's understanding of theophany and the divine revealing is quite literally juxtaposed between monotheism and polytheism, between the one and the many, and any assertion falling on one side of the polarity over the other tips the scales and is therefore untrue. His metaphysics results in the tension of opposites or the coincidentia oppositorum. Although Iamblichus was not laboring under the Quran and a predominantly monotheistic worldview, he does also come to many of the same conclusions, especially the notion of the soul as the site of the event of Epiphany, and that the soul embraces the contrarieties of unity and multiplicity, movement and stasis, and every form of coincidentia oppositorum. What is alarming about viewing the world through this theophanic vision of a bi-unity as a relationship between the soul and his lord or god 
is that incarnation in noikesis is not necessary on a physical level. We did not need to have spilled countless millions of pages of ink trying to resolve how the incarnation makes sense, how God took form in the flesh of Jesus Christ. It now becomes clear that the creature is what is manifested of the divine being. And yet the reciprocal relationship is that the divine being is given form in the material world through the creature's imaginal expression and movement toward it. It is through the divine primordial imagination that epiphanies emerge and reveal themselves. And it is precisely through the true imagination residing within each person that we can perceive these epiphanies or theophanies in their true light. This is what it means to pray. As you sit or kneel or lay down to pray, you are enacting one side of the prayer, to which God or your Lord Angel is the other side, praying simultaneously in response to form the totality of that act in a circular manner, thus re-establishing the totality of your being. The bi-unity that underlies this theophanic prayer actually recreates the cosmos each micro-millisecond, an increment of time so infinitesimally small that the human cannot detect it. It is precisely in this almost non-existent point where being changes to becoming, or the same changes to the different, that this creation and simultaneous destruction takes place. What I am saying is that the world is simultaneously destroyed and renewed every imperceptible moment, because everything, as Heraclitus once said, changes. His quote specifically is that, quote, the only constant in life is change. In fact, this calls into question our entire notion of causality. This is an enormous topic. But to be brief, let us say that one action in the material realm does not cause an effect in another part of it. The intermediary always exists through the transcendental archetype. Whatever occurs in the material or sensible world has a correspondence with that event which pre-existed it in actuality on a higher level of being. This is how we are to understand synchronicities as a causal phenomena. The modern consciousness has managed to make a very profound hermetic statement into something rather banal, so it is important to revisit banal propositions once in a while and reimagine them and imbue them with the numinosity they deserve. Quad est superius est sicut quad inferius, et quad inferius est sicut quad est superius. That which is above is like to that which is below, and that which is below is like to that which is above. Corbin wants us to emphasize that that which is above is like to that which is below. The word like is critical here. This world is not simply a duplication of the other world. It is like it. There is some fundamental change in its ousia. Just as each microsecond we are dying and being reborn, and the images seem to us fixed and constant, so that we assume there is a continuity of images, but our soul is not fully identical to the image we represented half a millisecond ago, but we are certainly like it. Iamblichus would no doubt agree because he did not view the soul as static or constant, even in its essence. He believed upon descent into the material world contra Plotinus that the soul undergoes a change, both in its substance and its essence, and can also change in these qualities throughout its embodied existence. A part of the soul does not remain undescended in the noetic realm in a state of unchangeability and perfection, as Pinus asserts. Henry Corbin relates the following. In the Acts of Peter, a book belonging to those so-called apocryphal collections which were particularly esteemed and me meditated upon in Gnostic and Manichaean circles, we read a narrative that provides an exemplary illustration of theophanic vision. Before a gathering of people, the Apostle Peter refers to the scene of the transfiguration that he had witnessed in Mount Tabor, and essentially all he can say is this, Talem eum vidi qualem caperi potui, I saw him in such a form as I was able to take in. Now in this gathering there are several widows afflicted at once with physical blindness and incredulity of heart. The apostle speaks to them in a tone of urgency, perceive in your mind that which ye see not with your eyes. 
The assemblage begins to pray, and thereupon the hall is filled with a resplendent light. It does not resemble the light of day, but is an ineffable, invisible light, such as no man can describe. And this radiant, invisible light shines into the eyes of these women, who alone are standing in the midst of the prostrate assemblage. Afterward, when they are asked what they have seen, some have seen an old man, others a youth, still others a little child who lightly touched their eyes and made them open. Each one has seen, in a different form, appropriate to the capacity of her being, each one may say, Talem eum vidi qualem caperi potri. In defense of the docetic perspective, Corbin criticizes historical realism for its critique of docetism, which he says, quote, accuses docetism of reducing facts to appearances without suspecting that appearance is raised to the level of apparition or upon what stage spiritual facts are in reality enacted. The realization is that docetism does not reduce reality to a mere appearance but makes reality, quote, transparent to the transcendent meaning manifested in it. Take care for now.